And we began our study this morning on the feeding Jesus, the feeding Jesus. And there in that passage of scripture, we studied that he fed 5,000 people. And that's just the men. So we entitled this lesson and this sermon series, The Feeding Jesus. We studied this morning two questions. What is the purpose of the miracle? The answer was that Jesus manifested himself as the bread of life. And as the rest of the text unfolds, we ask ourselves these questions. How shall we receive the bread of life? The answers was, were like a child and by his grace. In that message, I mentioned that old book that I have in my possession, Fleetwood's Life of Christ. Here's what Fleetwood said about this particular text. You'll have to read the text again. I'm not going to do that tonight, but please have it in your possession and read it sometimes again. Here's what Fleetwood said. The disciples were so alarmed at the cruel fate of the Baptist. Now, just recently, John the Baptist had been slain. His head had been chopped off. And the disciples were so alarmed at the cruel fate of the Baptist, whose memory they highly revered, that they returned from their mission and assisted in performing the last offices to the body of their old master. Many of the apostles, having been originally disciples of John, as soon as these pious rites were over, they repaired to Jesus and told him all that had happened. Their compassionate master, on hearing their melancholy news, retired with them by sea into a desert place belonging to Bethsaida, that by retirement, meditation, and prayer, they might be refreshed and recruited for their spiritual labors and at the same time leave an example to us that we should often retire from the noise and hurry of the world and offer up most fervent prayers to our Heavenly Father. The precedent set by our Lord in this setting is also followed by the apostles beginning at the beginning of the church. For when a disagreement about the administration of the Grecian widows arose, they said, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This precedent right now is only partially practiced by ministers of the word. Ministers today may take a vacation or may take a few days off, but there are very seldom ministers who take time off just to be with the Lord and to study his word and to refresh themselves and get ready for more service. I think it might be a good time for the church of God in these busy days in which we live to require such a practice. Require it. So we're not going to have a pastor that cannot get alone with God a certain time of the year and get something from God himself and just get alone with him. We need more people, not only from the pulpit, preachers in the pulpit, but we need more people who will make it a practice to retire from the busy world in which we live and to get alone with God and his word. I doubt if there are any of us who do that. But that's what the disciples and Jesus were attempting to do in this uh, story that we've been studying which I've entitled The Feeding Jesus. But for Jesus was feeding the people, he had retired to get alone with his heavenly father. He had left the busyness of the ministry. And the disciples now were discouraged and sad because of the passing of John the Baptist. And they needed 
a revival in their spirits, a renewal in their hearts. Now, folks, I know that we have, quote, revivals. But I want you to know something else. In our t attempts to have revival, we schedule a meeting, we schedule a preacher, and we try our best to get lost people to come or get even Christians to come. It's hard now to get Christians to come to church. And we try our best to get people to come to church where the lost are saved. And we get a revival speaker and say, okay, let's have a revival speaker. Maybe he'll say something or do something that will stir hearts. And we have sometimes even cottage prayer meetings. But there has been very, very little time where we individually have gone aside for a personal, individual Revival. E.M. Bounds states this, The men who have most fully illustrated Christ in their character and have most powerfully affected the world for Him have been men who spent so much time with God as to make it a notable feature of their lives. Charles Simeon devoted the hours from four till eight in the morning to God. Mr. Wesley spent two hours daily in prayer. There would be no Methodists if it were not for that. He began at four in the morning. Of him who knew him well, wrote, he thought prayer to be more his business than anything else. And I have seen him come out of the closet with a serenity of his face next to shining. John Fletcher stained the walls of his room by the breath of his prayers. Sometimes he would pray all night, always frequently and with great earnestness. His whole life was a life of prayer. I would not rise from my seat, he said, without lifting my heart to God. His greeting to a friend was always, did I meet you praying? Now that's a good thought. Luther said, if I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the victory through the day. I have so much business I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. L Luther had a motto. He that has prayed well has studied well. Archbishop Layton was so much alone with God that he seemed to be in perpetual meditation. Prayer and praise were his business and his pleasure, says his biographer, Bishop Ken. Uh, Bishop Ken was so much with God that his soul was said to be God enamored. He was with God before the clock struck three every morning. Bishop Ashbury said, Ashbury, another one. I propose to rise at four o'clock as often as I can and spend two hours in prayer and meditation. Samuel Rutherford, the fragrance of whose piety is still rich, rose at three in the morning to meet God in prayer. Joseph Allen arose at four o'clock for his business of praying till eight, four to eight. If he heard other tradesmen plying businesses of their businesses before he was up, he would exclaim, oh, how this shames me. Doth not my master deserve more than theirs? He who has learned this trade well draws at will and on sight and with acceptance of heaven's unfailing bank. I think I need to read that one again. He who has learned this trade well draws at will on sight and with acceptance of heaven's unfailing bank. I know a man that uh, won, was won to the Lord by my dad down in Lawrence, South Carolina, and um, he got a hold of this thought. He was a single man and an older man. And he got a hold of this thought of praying. And he would go in his room. He lived with his brother, two single men, older now. And he would begin to pray out loud. And he prayed so out loud that his brother complained to him and said, you've got to quieten it down a little bit. I can't, I can't live with all that. And I would even leave the house and ask him to quieten it down or to leave. So they had a real problem because 
this man would pray so much and so loud. The retirement from the business of ministry was the intention of the Lord in this particular scene, the feeding of the 5,000. It was not just a time of rest and relaxation like most people think. It was a time to recharge the spiritual battery and to get ready to continue even more in the ministry. And I'm thinking now of the many conferences that are in America. I could go to a conference every single month. I could be away from this church on a regular basis attending some conference. I could do that. There are many. The Sword of the Lord Conference in July is one that I could spend a week at. And then there are others as well, many others. And I'm thinking these conferences have as a motive... Many of those who uh, organize these conferences have as a motive, and I'm Shelter, Shelter Smith of the Sword of the Lord, the paper that we have in the back. Shelter Smith, I know that he has as a motive that we're going to have the Sword Conference in July, and it's a time for spiritual renewal where the pastors can get refired and refueled and go back and do a greater work for the Lord with new ideas, etc. I could go to conference after conference after conference. I could be gone from home weeks and weeks and weeks during the year. I have chosen not to do that. And I'll tell you the reason why. One of the reasons that I don't attend all these many conferences is this. There's so much work to do. And there's so few laborers. Wednesday night you found out what it was like not to have somebody that just regularly is here and pastors and preaches in this pulpit. Did you not find that out? It's a diff it makes a difference. It makes a world of difference. And when you don't have the help, then you have to stay close by. So I think that some of the conferences, though, have become more busy work. They have not become a retirement to refresh and to renew the spiritual batteries and so if a conference had been organized, I could go to California for a conference. I'll tell you what, I wonder how that would go over if I spent several hundred thousand dollars, maybe thousands of dollars during a year just to go to conferences like California. Oh, a conference in Hawaii would be nice, wouldn't it? It would be really be nice. You say, well, preacher, you would bankrupt the church. I could bankrupt the church by going to all these conferences, couldn't I? I could. So I've chosen not to do that, but I think a lot of the conferences don't have as their motive spiritual refreshing and renewal. Now, you might get some good ideas, and there's a, something to be said for that. I know a preacher who is constantly drawing from these conferences new ideas. And I'm always amazed. I, I look at some of the things that he does and I say, where did you get that idea? And if I dig a little bit deeper and poke him a little bit, well, I went to a such and such a conference and such and such a speaker gave me that idea. And I'm thinking, I thought he got that from the Lord. But he went to some conference somewhere and they said, this worked for us and it probably ought to work for you. And so I know that he this man that I'm speaking of that goes to many conferences, he always seems to have a new project. He's always got something going on. And it always seems to work. And I'm totally amazed. I cannot believe it. But you know what I think? Here's what he's doing. He's not getting spiritually renewed. He's borrowing brains. You can borrow brains, but you cannot borrow character. Bob Jones Sr. said that. Amen? So it's not wrong to borrow brains. So that's what this preacher does. He goes to conferences to get good ideas. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I want to tell you something. God is not in the fast food spiritual business. God is not in the fast food spiritual business. When he goes to this mountain and retires to this mountain in John chapter 6, this is a time for spiritual renewal. And it's not fast. It's going to take some time. 
Now, of course, that didn't happen on this occasion. They were interrupted by the crowds. The crowds followed them, and they were interrupted by the crowds. Now, that's amazing. Here he was trying to give the disciples some spiritual uh, revival, and uh, his own self needed some energy from the Lord himself and uh, from God in heaven and from the Holy Spirit of God. And instead, it was serve again. How many of you know that sometimes that's exactly what happens? Serve again, serve again, serve again. That's exactly what happens. But God is not in a quickie revival, a fast food revival. God wants you and I to get alone with him and to be spiritually renewed and spiritually refreshed. Now, I want to continue with this story. And you know from the story that Andrew finds the little lad. You read the story again in John chapter 6, but most of you know that Andrew is the one that finds the little lad. And I do not know how Andrew spied the little lad and his lunch. I don't know. But John chapter 6 and verse 8 says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, to Jesus, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Andrew was a disciple who was always observant of others and not only always observant of others, but he was usually found bringing others to Jesus. Now, I want you to think about Andrew for just a minute. If Andrew was thinking about his own hunger and his own need, and if he was thinking about John the Baptist's death, and if he was thinking about all these people, and what are we going to do? And he did say that, that what are these? They are among so many. He did say that. He knew there was a big crowd of people. But if he had just been thinking, I've got to do something for all of these 5,000 people. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what Jesus is going to do. I do not know what the rest of the disciples are going to do. He could have gone completely berserk, thinking, how are we going to take care of these people? Let me give you an example, folks. If all of a sudden 200 people walked into the door of this church completely unsaved, would you not get a little bit concerned? What are we going to do? Right? Wouldn't you say, whoa, preacher, 200 people? That'd be something, wouldn't it? Think of 5,000. Think of 5,000. What are we going to do? Andrew could have thought, I'm going to be really tired. This is going to take a good long while today. Uh, we've already been up here and tried to run away from these people. Here these people are coming to us. He could have really got a negative attitude. But do you think Andrew did that? How many of you think Andrew got all upset about 5,000 men here? No, he didn't get upset. He's looking around, and all of a sudden he sees a little fellow. Again, I brought up that little fellow this morning, but I want you to know, maybe there weren't that many little guys there, little boys there. I don't know, but Andrew saw him. Can I ask you a question? I already read you the child text this morning as I read that about the little children. Jesus said, bring the little child unto me. Forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus said those things to the disciples, they knew they had been rebuked. Can I say something to each of us? There are children running all around these communities, everywhere. And Jesus says, bring them to me. Doesn't he? Isn't Jesus saying to, listen, folks, we got people moving in here so fast. I don't even know where they're coming. They're coming from all over the country and all over the world. And they're moving in here fast as lightning. And their little children are just up and down the street. Just like we found those teens on top of our building. These kids are everywhere. They're all over the place. Um, don't you think that there's a responsibility for us to be like Andrew? Hey, there's a 
There's a child. There's one. There's one. There's one. He was very observant of others. And he was bringing people to Jesus. Andrew was the one that found Peter and brought him to Jesus. Now think about that. That he was a brother to Peter. And he found his own brother. So not only should we see the little children out here, but we should see our family. So he found Peter before he ever found this little lad. But it, it, what, would, what would the church be like without Peter? I want you to think, what would the Bible be like without Peter? What would the book of Acts be like without Peter? What would the book of First and Second Peter be? The entire New Testament would be almost completely out of whack with no Peter in it. Think, think about it just a minute. Aren't you glad Andrew found Peter? And guess what? There's no book in the Bible named Andrew. He didn't write a book. But I'll tell you what he did do. He found somebody that could. You see, that little child that we invite to church, that uh, person, that family member that we bring to the Lord Jesus Christ, that person may be the one that will do the things that we could never do. Maybe they'll be the ones that'll be the next preachers of America or the next preacher's wives or missionaries or evangelists or whatever. We never know what God will do with the people that we find. And Andrew was finding people. He was observant of human people, uh, human uh, people and the human nature. He saw immediately that this little fellow had the lunch with him. So it was uh, later that Peter becomes a spokesman for the church at Antioch. The Lord did many wonderful things through Peter, like the calling of the Gentiles at the house of Cornelius. And uh, let's not forget who it was that did that. It was Andrew. Andrew knew the state or condition of the flock. He looked around and he saw what condition the people were in. He was observant of the condition. And he saw their hunger. He saw the need. And I think when he saw the child with the little lo the loaves, five loaves and two fish, I believe that when he saw that, he said, here's somebody that is going to take care of his need. But the rest of these people have the same need. What are we going to do about that? He saw the need. How many of you think that there really is a true spiritual hunger out here? Is there a true spiritual hunger in this world? I think there is. You say, preacher, how do you know there is? What well, aren't people trying to find happiness in a thousand different ways? Well, what is that trying to find happiness in a thousand different ways? It's the hunger of the heart. And you and I have the only bread of life. We have that bread of life. It behooves each of us to know the state and the condition of the people around us. We are not to be busybodies in other men's affairs, but we are to know the true situation of the people around us. Are we concerned and interested in people? I think that is a very key point. That is a very key point. Are we really interested and concerned about people around us? You say, preacher, I can be concerned when they have a death in the family. I can be concerned when they have illness. I can have that kind of concern. And that mercy that we can show to people, that mercy is so needed. That compassion that we can show to those who are and that kind of need is definitely a plus. But can I ask you something else? People may have physical needs that we are compassionate about, but can we not get compassionate about a spiritual need? Somebody say amen. Don't we need that? Don't we need to see people that have a spiritual hunger? Most people are insecure and spend most of their time in searching for their own security. They erroneously think that if I don't care for myself, nobody else will. 
And I tell you something, Christians all over this country, and here, this is just for us though tonight, the Christians in this building, if we, and I'm including myself, we, 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 if we could really think about people and say, I care to those people that we see. The true Christian spirit is to say, I care. The false Christian spirit is to say, it's not any of my concern. If Christians would be just like Andrew, there would be less insecurity among people and others. Philippians chapter 2, 4 says this, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Paul tells us in Philippians plainly, don't think about your own things. Think about the things of others. That is a plain scriptural principle. So number one, Andrew finds the little lad with a little lunch. That's what I want to bring to our attention tonight. The second thing that I want to bring to you is by the person of Philip. So I'm picking two disciples out of this story. I'm picking Andrew out first, and now I'm picking Philip out. Philip is the one that knows how to count. He knows that the numbers don't work. Now, he's probably not the treasurer of the crowd, but I'm thinking maybe that since Judas is not in the picture yet, that it could be Philip that was kind of in control of whatever meager of uh, cash they might have had or money they might have had. I don't know that, but somebody was counting and Philip was counting. He could count. He knew there's 5,000 people here. Plus, and uh, it would take a lot of money. I could see Philip going, okay, that's, uh, I don't think the next town has enough food for this crowd. I can almost see him calculating that. So let's read it in John 6, 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him. He, now there's that word company again. And that's the word that Luke used. Luke used uh, that word company. Set them by fifties in the company. And he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? The Lord Jesus knew the need. Did Jesus know the need? Does Jesus expect us to know the need? Yes, he does. If we have Jesus, we should know the need. Jesus knew the need. He knew they were hungry. Knew they had to have food. No telling how many meals they had already missed. They had come from different parts and had retired there with him. So here we are. And he asked Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, now notice that Philip. Now the Lord's proven Philip. I want you to know something right now. Can I tell you something flat out, straight out? The Lord is proving you right now by saying, all right, you see the need, you see the people, you hear the message. Now, what are you going to do? He's saying that to me. He's saying that to you. He's proven us with the message. The Holy Spirit of God is proving each of us with this message. No one is excluded. Everyone's included in this proving. So, he, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Do you know that Jesus is going to save souls in this area? Jesus is going to give food to the people of this area. He knows what he's going to do. The question is, are we going to be involved with his plan? Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. I wonder if Philip might have been holding the 200 penny worth, or if he was just making a calculation. But he could count. Now, can I tell you something? There are a lot of us here, I'm one of those kind of people that I can count the pennies, and I can count the nickel, nickels and the dimes, and the quarters, and, and the dollars, and so on. I can count. 
And I know, hey, by the way, it takes a lot of money, more money now to do what we do than it did uh, two years ago, right? Taking a lot more money to do it. I can count. And it's getting difficult. I don't like to pump $55 worth of gas. Do you? I can count. You say, well, preacher, if we had a bus and we ran that bus, it would take hundreds of dollars of gas. Yeah, it would. That's the counting. We do. We count like that. So Philip says, Lord, basically, I'm paraphrasing, there's no way we can feed these people. And do you know what? A person who's always counting says, not possible. Can't do it. You know what, folks? We do a whole lot of counting of who's here, and we do also a lot of counting of who's not here. But we seldom think that Jesus can do anything about it. I want you to know Jesus wants to do something about it. And our counting sometimes has absolutely zero faith. Come on. Amen? You say, I can count. I can count too. Yeah, I can count. But a lot of times that counting has no faith. Does the Lord test our faith when he knows already what he's going to do? According to our text, he does. Jesus knows what he's going to do in this area for his honor and his glory. He already knows it. He knows the answer before we ask him. Isaiah 65, 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Now that text is about the millennial reign of Christ. And it's talking about the Jews that have accepted Christ as their Messiah. And he says, those ones that have accepted me as their Messiah, he said, man, before they even ask me, I'm going to answer their prayer. That is a Jesus that knows what's on our hearts. Jesus already knows the problem, and he knows that he's going to perform a miracle that will intervene in the problem and that the problem will cease to exist. But he still proves us to see what kind of faith we're going to have in a difficult situation. Is this a difficult situation? Would somebody say amen? This is a difficult situation. Is he proving our faith? I think so. As we know, Jesus did not rebuke Philip. Neither did he rebuke Andrew. At least these two men, by the way, they were both of Bethsaida. And Bethsaida is the place where there are. The outskirts of Bethsaida is where they are. So these people are, Philip and Andrew, are from the very city. And they're on the outskirts of this city. And so they knew the people. It was not hard. There was not thousands upon thousands of people. They knew the people. By the way, it's surprising to me, 5,000 that they were feeding must have came from miles away because these are small little villages. But anyway, these men knew their hometown. It was their hometown where they were close by. They knew how much bread was there. And they didn't see any way out. But Jesus knew. He said, you don't know what to do, but I do. How many of you can hear Jesus say to me and to you right now, you don't know what to do about this difficult situation around you, but I know. Amen? Does Jesus know? He does. He knows. That's the way it is with Jesus. He says, you don't know what to do, but I do. Let's get to work and see what happens at my commands. And here's what he said. Now think about this. Jesus knows what he's going to do. Does he tell Philip and Andrew, I'm fixing to break bread and to multiply fishes for 5,000 people. Just hold on, guys. I'm fixing to perform a big miracle. Did he tell them that? No. He says, Make the men sit down. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If I'd been Philip and Andrew and some of the other disciples, I'd said, I'd have rolled my eyes. 
I really would have. I said, this is ridiculous. What in the world does he think he's doing? I mean, we've got... Can you, how many of you can imagine five thousand? Hey, we came by Strawberry USA yesterday. How many of you know where Strawberry USA is? Highway 11. We came by there yesterday. It was so crowded. They were having a corn maze. They were having uh, hay rides and all the rest of the stuff. And there were people on both sides of the road. Every parking lot was full. Cars were parked down the road a half a mile. And we just stopped in there to do a Zoom call, and uh, that's all we did. And so uh, we weren't in part of that crowd. We weren't going on the hayride. We didn't go on the corn maze thing. We didn't do any of that stuff. But I never saw so many people on a country place in my life. There was a pile of people there. Now, I want you to imagine me. You think of me jumping out in the middle of the road and saying, okay, sit down over here. How many of you think that would have worked? No way. There's no way that crowd was going to sit down anywhere. As Jesus says, make the men sit down. That's in verse 10. Men don't like to sit down, nor do they like to be told what to do. Somebody say amen. amen. That's exactly right. Amen. So I can see these men. I, I, you say, preacher, they were acting like little puppy dogs. They just ran around, you know, and just, okay, Mr. Disciple, I sit anywhere you tell. No, men don't like to be told what to do and don't like to sit down either. Now, here's what they did. They sat down in numbers. Mark says 50s and 100s, and Luke says, I think, 50s in a company, something like that. And I said this morning that it was probably in a perfect square, one one fellow said it was in a perfect square, 5,000 in a perfect square. And then they were separated by those companies. So I can see 100 in a perfect square, 10 by 10. I can see that. But I can't see the 50s in a perfect square. But I can see 25 in a perfect square. So how many of you know that it's possible that they had a perfect square of 5,000? That's possible. I didn't say it was in the Bible, but it's possible. But did the Lord tell them to sit by, down by certain numbers? He did. So everything was going to be done decently and in order. And Jesus is the person of order. And uh, he says, you just carry out my command. You do it orderly like it should be done. So you just imagine how that could have been done. Now, why did, they, why did the Lord seat them like that? Why did the Lord put them down in certain companies? You know, there's, you can figure this out. I'm not figuring it out. But you can divide 12. There weren't 12 by this time. Uh, so there was less than 12. But anyway, you figure it out if there were 10, and I don't think there were 10 yet. But anyway, if you figured it out, that would be so many disciples per hundreds of people. You can divide it out. I'm not going to do it. But you could figure it out. Well, that's good. But what did the Lord do it for? Did he say, okay, this disciple has a certain amount, this disciple has a certain amount, this, I don't know. But I know this. He had them to sit down in an orderly arrangement so that it would be easier to pass the bread and the fish out. Does the Lord want to make it hard on his disciples? Do you think he's saying, ah, oh, just let them mingle anywhere they want to do and just run around like chickens with your head cut off and pass it out the bread, pass out the fish? No, he wanted to make it as easy as possible on the disciples. Can I tell you something right now? If the Lord has some work to do here in this place, he's going to do his best to make it as easy as possible. Amen? Amen? Did Jesus say, my yoke is hard? Did he say that? Did he say, my burden is real heavy? Is that what Jesus said? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what he said. Now let me tell you something. Jesus does not want to make this ministry right here hard. He wants to make it easy for us to do. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, and all you that labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The disciples had been overwhelmed with the death of John the Baptist and the constant crowds surrounding Jesus. Jesus did not want them to be stressed out. He wanted to make their job easy. Jesus took care of the crowd and he'll take care of you. How many of you believe that? 
Yes, Jesus took care of that crowd, and he took care of you. Wouldn't you like to have seen him breaking the bread? Wouldn't you like to have seen him multiplying the fish? I'd love to have seen multiplying the fish for sure. Do you know what he's doing right now? Come on, now listen to me. He's taking his food, the Word of God, and he's breaking it. And he's giving it to you and 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 to me. And he says, now you just go ahead and by faith partake of me. And let's see what God can do. Amen. How many of you believe in miracles? I believe in miracles. God will take care of us. Now, I want you to know something while I'm closing. I'm closing. So help me, I'm closing. But do you think that Jesus gave them cold sardines and cold bread? Do you think this was old hard tack stuff that had been set up somewhere in a cave and had gotten hard and moldy and the fish were like dried sardines? How many of you think Jesus fed him like that? I think the bread was hot and fresh. How many of you like fresh bread? And I think he not only had hot, fresh bread, but I think he had warm fish. Amen? How many of you like good, warm food? Does anybody like cold food? Some people do, but I don't. Can I give you a thought here? The food that Jesus gives to you tonight is supposed to be fresh. I mean, just right on the money. It should be right exactly what you need. And I'll tell you what. He gives that to you and to me so that we can be refreshed and do his will and go out just like Andrew and Philip did and bring others to partake of the food that Jesus has. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson today. I pray that you'll use it in our hearts and in our lives. Guide us and direct us, dear Lord. There's much to do, and we can get so involved in the busy work that we forget to get the spiritual work done. And I pray that you'll help us to put first things first. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, you say, Pastor Waters, the Lord spoke to my heart. I really need to spend more time with Jesus. Can I see your hands? Amen. Amen and amen. Father, thank you for this time together. I pray that you'll bless us now as we go our separate ways in just a few minutes. But help us not to forget the lessons today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing 295. 295. Let's start with the second stanza on 295. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you? for me come home come home ye who are weary come home earnestly tenderly Jesus is calling calling oh sinner Come home on the third as the last. Time is now fleeting. The moments are passing. Passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering. Deathbeds are coming. Coming for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home.
Father, thank you for this time together. Bless us as we go our separate ways. May we obey your word in Jesus' name. Amen.